we're looking at the book of Hebrews because uh, there is a theme in the book of Hebrews that I feel like God is telling us this year. And that theme is that Jesus is better. He's better than anything out there. He's better than anything we can imagine. He's better than anything the world has to offer. This writer, we don't know who he is, is writing to a church in the city of Rome that's going through incredible difficulties in their lives. They are a small church, maybe 60, 70, 80 people max. But they are from a Jewish background. Their Jewish family has rejected them and thrown them out. The government hates them and is persecuting them. They're living in a culture where everything is accepted but the gospel. And they're living in a society where Christianity is rejected. And they're trying to live for Jesus. Many at this point are wondering if it's even worth following Jesus because all they face is persecution, ridicule, and isolation. They're wondering if it's worth being a follower of Jesus in a world that hates them. And so many have, are on the fence about their faith. Should I follow Jesus? If I don't, life would be so much easier for me. If I don't, I will have a job. If I don't, my, I will have my home. If I don't, everything will be okay. Should I follow Jesus? And life is, and they're on a fence of whether they should follow Jesus or not. And the writer writes to them and says, Jesus is better. He's so much better than the world. He's so much better than your family. He's so much better than materials or possessions. He's better. And so he talks to them in chapter one about how Jesus has done everything for them. And he tells them not to neglect this great salvation that's been offered to them. And their readers hear that and they're walking out of church and they say, Jesus did everything for me. He's great. He's marvelous. But does God know what I'm going through in life? Does God know the challenges and the difficulties that I'm facing? Does God know where I am today? It's great that God is going to restore me. It's great that one day I will be a ruler over the earth and... Um, Sin will be vanquished, but right now, it's difficult. Right now, it's challenging. Right now, I'm facing hardships in life. Does God care? And so the writer, knowing their response, says, hey, let me give you, let me show you why Jesus is better than your suffering. And we hit one verse last week. We talked about how these guys were embarrassed for their faith. These people were embarrassed because everyone was ridiculing them. These guys come out of a Jewish background, right? They're followers of God, Yahweh. And now here's Jesus saying, I'm God. To the Jew, the idea that a holy God would die on a cross is blasphemous. And so their family rejects them and says, you are in heresy. You are following a false God. And so their family has reject, rejected them. And then they're living in a culture that's um, from a Greek culture. In a Greek culture... The body is evil, the soul is good. And so what the goal of life is to be separated from the body. And so now you have the idea that Almighty God actually takes on the form of a body, and for them it's folly. So the Jews, the Jews ridicule and reject them. The Greeks are laughing at them. And these guys are embarrassed for their faith. And the writer says, listen, Jesus is better. He's the trailblazer. He comes and takes on human flesh. And when he dies on the cross, he's like, he's setting a trailblaze. He's cutting through hell and sin and the devil and all of this stuff. And he's, and he's creating a pathway for you to get to heaven. Not only is he creating a pathway for you, but the idea of the text is, I'm not just making a pathway for you, but I'm putting you on my back and I'm carrying you so that you can get into the presence of God. He says, the cross, while it's folly to the world, you can boast in it because it is in the cross you find everything that brings you joy and satisfaction. So the first trial that these Jews were facing is that they were embarrassed for their faith. The second thing that they were facing, I'm going to hit three of them today, and there's quite a bit of stuff here that I want to look at. But the second thing that they were facing is they were ashamed for what they lost. One of the biggest trials that they faced was that these were Jewish folks. They were not accepted by their family and friends who refused to associate with them. Following Jesus was very costly, and that rejection came with a deep sense of shame. Let me explain the culture so you get it. The culture that they lived in was all about honor and shame, and some of us have grew up in that culture. Family meant everything to them. Where we live, individualism has much more of a priority than family does. All that matters is the individual and what that individual does. Family ties really don't matter where we live. 
However, a lot of us grew up in a culture where family was everything, right? Family was so important. The culture to which this writer is writing to was completely opposite. It was a culture where family meant everything. It wasn't about individualism. Think about this. Today, if you go and write a resume, if you're trying to apply for a job and you write a resume, what do you put on it? You put all of your qualifications. You, you put all the things that you've done. Do you list the name of your family members? You don't. You talk about where you went to school. You talked about where you worked. You talked about what skills you have. You talk about what professional references you have. Your professional references aren't your family members. They're people outside that have seen you work and seen you do work, and they are the ones who can refer you. But in that culture, back then, if you wanted a job, when you submitted a resume, it listed all of your family members. It said, here's my family. Here's who I'm the son of. Here's who my uncle is. Here's who my grandfather is. Here's what my family does. Here's my resume. And on the basis of who they were is how they were accepted. That's how it was in their culture. This church, these group of believers, because of their identification with Christ, is feeling great shame because they don't have family anymore. Their family would say, don't refer to me. Don't talk to, talk to people about me. Their resume was gone. They couldn't get a job. They couldn't get anything. Anyone that they loved and identified with were people that had rejected them. They couldn't even put their family members on their resume anymore. They couldn't go and say, I'm the son of so-and-so because so-and-so doesn't want anything to do with them because they're following Jesus. Add to that, there's a verse in chapter 10 that says now the government is going in and taking their property from them. The government was coming after them with full force because Christianity was an illegal religion. In that culture, you've got to understand this. People didn't just buy homes that was close to their jobs. Homes were passed down to them from family members. It was a family home. So the parents, when they die, or would pass it on to their children, and their children would pass it on. This was family homes that were taken from them. And now they're, the brothers and sisters of these folks are coming. Are you a fool? You have just cost us our home. You have just cost us our family name. You've cost everything our family has worked hard for. You've cost everything that our grandparents have done and worked hard for. And because you're following Jesus, all of it is taken. You can understand the shame that these guys were feeling. Family rejects them. Their property is gone. They can't get a job. And they're coming to church and the, people are, the writer is saying Jesus is better. But it doesn't feel like that at all. And to that, the writer writes in verse 11 of chapter 2. He says, For he who sanctifies... And those who are sanctified, verse 11, um, all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. The writer basically says, listen, it's Jesus who sanctifies us. He is in the process of making us more like him. This Jesus has taken the same nature as us. When it says one source there, okay, maybe it doesn't say back there, it means one family. Do you have verse 11? Daryl? Oh, perfect. Um, it mean, we all come from the same lineage. He entered into the human race now. He takes on human flesh. So now he is one with us. We have the same origin. We have this, we're from the same human race. But that's not all. To answer the shame, Jesus looks at this church and he looks to us and he doesn't simply identify with us as a fellow human being. He actually says that I will be your brother now. When your brother has rejected you, when your parent has rejected you, when your family has rejected you, when your wife has left you, when all sorts of stuff is going on, I will come in and I'll say, I'll be your brother. I'll be your family. Think of the imagery here. Picture Jesus coming to these beat up group of people who've been rejected by family, society, and says, I'm not ashamed of you. I'm not going to reject you. I am proud of you. I will be your brother. You've lost your family. You've lost your possessions, but I will be your brother. People have rejected you because of your faith, but I will accept you. People don't want to be associated with you, but listen, I'll put my hand around your shoulders and I'll say you're mine. I'll say you're mine. Not only does he call them brothers, but the idea behind the language here is that he delights to call them brothers. It's not like I've got family members where if someone says, oh, it's such and such part of your family, I'm like, 
I guess so. He's part of my family, right? Um, That's not what Jesus is saying here at all. He's saying, I delight. I am proud of them. I am so glad they're part of my family. It's like we're like billionaires and people want to associate with us. That's what Jesus is saying. I want to be identified with you. I want people to know that I'm your family. I want people to know that I'm your brother. I want people to know that I care about you. I delight in the fact that we're part of the same family. That's the imagery behind the text here. It's not like, oh, he's part of my church or he's, he prayed a prayer and he's now part of the church. I am so proud. I am so glad. I am so excited that he's a part of my family. Can you imagine to this group of people that were feeling ashamed what that felt like? Where Jesus says, I don't just simply identify you, identify with you, but I call you my brother, my sister with a smile. And this isn't just some religious rhetoric. He's not just simply trying to make these guys feel better about their situation. This was truth. He means exactly what he says. And when he says that they are brothers and my sisters, he's proud of them. The verb that's used there is a continuing declaration. This is always this way. I will always be proud of you. I will, this will always be true. There is never going to be a day when I'm going to be ashamed of you. I will always declare publicly, you are my brother. And I'll do it with a smile on my face. In other words, it doesn't matter what's going to happen in your life, what challenges you face, what difficulties you go through. Jesus will identify with you. He's there with you. I don't know about you, but for me, that's an incredible thought. That is a powerful thought. In a fickle society like ours, where people come and go, where those who were your friends last year aren't your friends this year, where people turn their back on you and walk out the door, even though you invest so much into their lives, in a culture where we deal with divorce and families being separated, where dads are not part of their homes, you know what this is like. Where people accept you or reject you based on what you do in your life. Here's Jesus that comes in and says, puts his arms around you and says, Hey, brother. Hey, sister. You're part of my family. I'll never leave you. That meant a lot to these guys. That meant the world to them. It should mean the world to you this morning because the Bible says that if there's one person that will always be faithful to you without a shadow of a doubt, it's Jesus. He will always be faithful to you. In fact, it says, even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Have you ever thought about the implication of that statement? Remember those times when you wandered away from him and thought you didn't need him and you can do life on your own? Who's the one that never gave up on you? Remember those times when you thought you could do life on your own and you made a mess out of it? Who's the one who never abandoned you? Remember those times when Jesus was just an afterthought in your life and you really didn't think about him much? Who never stopped loving you? Even when we are unfaithful, He remains faithful. He calls you his brother. He calls you his sister. And he does it with pride. Do you know, I learned that this, looking at the Gospels this week, that if you go through the entire Gospels, while Jesus was on the earth, he never called his followers brothers. He would call them disciples. He'd call them sheep. He'd call them friends. But he never called them brothers till after the resurrection. All the while, while he lived with them, he never called them brothers. But after the cross, he does. Why? Because at the cross, in paying for your sins and my sins, and giving us his righteousness, now we are righteousness in Christ. Now he can call us brothers. Now he can call us sisters. The relationship now shifts and completely changes. Let me give you an example. In Matthew 28, Jesus just rose from the dead and two women walk to the tomb looking for Jesus and the angel shows up to the women and says, don't be afraid for you know that you see, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified, but he's not here. He's risen. Go and quickly and tell his disciples, disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he's going to go before you in Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus meets them and says, Greetings. And they come to him and took a hold of his hands and took a hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to him, Don't be afraid. 
go and tell my brothers, my brothers. No longer are you disciples. No longer are you simply followers of Jesus. No longer are you um, friends of Jesus. You are now brothers of Jesus. You are now sisters of Jesus. You know, there's a song that we sing that says, I am a friend of God, and that's a great song, and there's a lot of truth in that. But do you know there's even greater truth and deeper meaning in the idea that you are now part of the family of God. Friends come and go. Family is blood. You are part of his family. You are his brother. You are his sister. God is your father. He identifies with you. No matter what you're going through this morning, he puts his arm around you and says, you're my brother. I will never leave you. I'll never abandon you. I'll never forsake you. You are my family. I don't know if that gives you encouragement this morning, but it encourages me in tremendous ways. They are my brothers. I'm not gonna call them disciples anymore. I'm not gonna call them sheep. I'm not gonna call them friends, but they're my brothers. The whole relationship now shifts because of what Jesus did for us. We are the brothers and sisters of Jesus. And now what he does in verse 11 of chapter two is the writer goes to the Old Testament And he takes three different passages from the Old Testament. And he talks about some prophecies about Jesus. He actually takes passages from three different texts. One is from Psalms and two are from Isaiah. And together they form a testimony of how Jesus identifies with us as his church. And so he pulls these three different passages. And I want to look at all three of them and pull some truth from them. The first one is from the the Psalm 22. He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. This psalm is from Psalm 22. And if you grew up in a church that did communion, one of the passages that often was read before communion was Psalm 22. It is a psalm of suffering. It's about the suffering servant. And this, the church believes, and we believe that this psalm is talking about Jesus. It was a commentary of the feelings that Jesus was going through on the cross. The Gospels tell us what happened. This psalm tells us how Jesus was feeling as he was suffering on the cross. They show us what he felt like, what he was thinking as he was dying for your sins and my sins. Read Psalm 22 and you get, a, you get into the mind of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. And what the writer pulls from is from verse 22 of Psalm 22. This is after all of the suffering and the pain. This is after the crucifixion. It's after the resurrection. It's after the ascension. The scene is in heaven. Remember, we talked about in chapter one, how Jesus dies for us, resurrects, ascends into heaven, and the angels are applauding and celebrating that Jesus has conquered over sin and death. But here you see his first words. You, here you see Jesus' first words after he gets to heaven. He says, I'm going to tell them about you. I'm going to declare to them about you. How is he going to do that? In John 14, he says, after I ascend, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Do you realize that one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in your life is to proclaim to you how good and great God is, how marvelous he is, how wonderful he is. Romans tells us that the Spirit of God bears witness to our spirit that we are now children of God and we are co-heirs with Christ. He reminds us, listen, whatever you're going through, whatever challenge you're going through, let me remind you, you're God's child. He's with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He's with you. Don't forget that. It's rough right now, but he's with you. It's challenging right now, but he's with you. It's difficult right now, but he's not going to abandon you. That's one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. In other words, we are brothers and sisters with Christ, and the Father will constantly remind us of that. It's not that we will forget and we have to remember ourselves, but the Holy Spirit is there to remind us whose family we're part of. He says, I will sing of your praise in the midst of the congregation. That basically means that when we come together and we sing as a church and declare how God, how good and great God is, Jesus shows up and he sings with us. He's here with us when we sing and we celebrate. He's glorifying in the Father. He's worshiping the Father. He's magnifying the Father with us that when we gather together in the midst of the congregation, I will be there. This morning, he's here. The next verse that he says is, again, I will put my trust in him. This is a passage that's taken out of Isaiah 8. 
Isaiah is facing heavy persecution, being ridiculed and facing a lot of shame. And in the midst of that, he declares, I will trust God. The writer of Hebrews is saying this is also true of Jesus. Jesus went through persecution. He went through ridicule. He went through shame. And he trusted God and he stands with us today when we face those same things. He knows what it's like. Do you realize that? Jesus knows exactly what it's like to face shame, especially when people turn on you, deny you, reject you, or leave you. His own family didn't believe in him. They didn't accept him as the Messiah. And when he needed them the most, his own disciples abandoned him. Every single one of them leave him alone. He knows exactly what it's like. And he says, I will put my trust in you because I've been there. I felt what you feel. I faced what you face. And I trusted him and so can you. And then he brings up one more passage from the same chapter of Isaiah, chapter 8. And he says, again, behold, I and the children God has given me. He's referring back to the same passage in Isaiah. The city is completely surrounded by the Syrian army. They're about to take the Israelites captive. Isaiah knows that he's going to be captured and dragged through the streets of the city, and he's going to be put to shame. He doesn't know if he will live when the Syrian army captures him. He'll face all kinds of shame, and he turns to his children. And God tells Isaiah, Isaiah, rename the names of your children. Give them two new names. And for the life of me, I will never be able to pronounce their new names. So I'll just give you what their names mean, right? The first one, he says, their name will mean the removal of the oppressor. The enemy will be taken away. The second name is that Israel will be restored. The people will be restored. One is about the enemy and shame being removed. The other is about everything that you lost being returned back to you. Let me illustrate this. Can I get you three guys? Binol, Ruben, Jason. Let me get you guys to come up here for a second. It'll be fun. They have no idea what they're going to do. I'm going to make them sing. Watch. (laughs) Jason sing. Um, All right. Jason, if you could stand right there. Reuben, stand right there. Finn will stand in the middle. So you two are the sons of Isaiah. You, um, Reuben, your name will mean the the enemy has been taken away. Jason, your name will be um, that Israel has been restored. And Isaiah, as a father, comes and I want you to hug them. Hug them. Just hug them. You need this more than they do. You need some. (laughs) No, not like that. Just right next to them. And Isaiah, Isaiah hugs his children and says, I and the children God has given me. Our enemy will be taken away. Our hope will be given. But here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Then we'll move back. Then it looks like a good Isaiah. Um, hopefully I look like a better Jesus. Um, Jesus comes in and says, so it is for you as well. Jesus says, Isaiah said it about his children, but Jesus says, so it is for you as well. Whatever shame you're going through, Praise the Lord. Um, Whatever difficulty you're going through in life, it will be restored to you. You will get back what has been taken from you. Your shame, you guys can be seated. Your shame does not define you. What you went through, what people label you as, what people know you for, will not be what defines you because I will put my arms around you and I will declare you are mine. You're mine. That's what the writer of Isaiah is saying. God is going to bring us back, and my children are a testimony for this. Jesus says, church, here's you. You're rejected. You're ashamed. But you have hope that you will return. And Jesus comes to the church, puts his arms around you, and says, here I am. Here I am. He identifies with them. He puts his arms around them. Here I am and the children that you have given me. They feel ashamed, embarrassed, rejected, but you're mine. You feel this deep identification that Jesus has with you. He puts his arm around you. He identifies with you. Remember when I talked about how the people would write their resume and their resume had their genealogy and their family history? I want you to know their resume. They would put all of their resume, they would put on that resume their family members that had a good name and a reputation in society, right? If they had a black sheep in the family, they're not going to put that person on the resume. They don't want that um, the, um, employer calling the person that everyone hates, 
right? If someone has a criminal record and they're part of your family, you're not going to put them on your resume. But think about me and you. Jesus says, here's my resume. Here's my resume. Here's the people that are on my resume. It's me. It's you. We are on the resume of Jesus. And think about it. We're not the best, right? We're the black sheep. We're the ones that Jesus would say, they're not holy. They're not good. They don't do things right. But I'm going to put them on my resume. Because as I continue to work in them, I will produce something in them that the world would have to declare, this is a God thing. He is working in you. He is faithful to finish what he started in you. And Jesus says, you are, will be on my resume. When the world wants to know what I'm like, I will point them to you and they will see the difference that I have made in your life. They will see the change that has happened in you and they will declare how good you are, how good I am, how great I am. Whatever your, whatever your shame is, Jesus identifies you with this morning. Number two, they were scared for their lives. Another fear that this church faced is that they were afraid to die. It was a very real possibility for them. Nero has taken office. He has started persecuting the church. No one has died yet, but the risk is a reality. And even though none had died, they were already facing a lot of troubles. They lost their possessions. They lost their family. One word from their authorities and they could have been carted out for execution. Many people face the fear of death today. You fear pain. You fear separation. You fear unknown. Every unbeliever that doesn't know Jesus is in slavery to the fear of death. They try to suppress it through making a lot of money or career or relationships. They want to convince themselves that they really matter and they count for something. But ultimately, death is coming Then nothing counts anyway because all of it will be taken away from you. It's all washed away. It's all gone. So people live with a deep sense of fear apart from Christ. They are enslaved to death. But the gospel as a Christian calms the fear of death for us. Because Jesus died, he actually turns death on its head for us. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, this is the next verse, verse 12, I believe. He himself likewise partook of the same thing. He becomes like us, identifies with us, that through death he might destroy the one that has the power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus identifies with them and says that my mission is twofold. Number one, to break the power of the devil in your life who holds a slave over death, and then secondly, to rescue those who have been enslaved by it. What it says to destroy, it means literally to strip power from, to take the power from the enemy. It means that Jesus invaded the strong man's house. He disarmed him. He robbed him. Robbed him of what? Robbed him of the ability to hold death as a means of intimidation over the heads of God's people. You can't intimidate them anymore. Bottom line is Jesus basically punched Satan in the mouth, stripped him of any power that he has, and he doesn't have it anymore over me and you. You ask how? That is still happening, right? I'm still afraid to die, right? I'm still, I don't want to die yet. I want to live. I love Jesus. I'm not excited to die. How does that take place? Because Jesus is a stronger weapon than death. What is that? It's called eternal life. It's called eternal life. Death now enters you into eternal life with him. That's the greater weapon. Death can't touch that. In fact, what Jesus did was turn death from being an enemy to now it becoming our friend. Because death is now the entrance to the presence of God, to eternal joy, to eternal life. Satan might threaten you with death, but he doesn't have a weapon anymore. It's kind of like Jesus took Satan's AK-47 and made it into a water gun. It has no power at all. What used to intimidate us, what used to cause us fear, now promises hope to us because it brings us to the presence of Jesus. The way to eternal life is through resurrection, but the way to resurrection is through death. So Jesus had to experience death so that he could be resurrected and thereby give us life 
and deliver us from the fear of death. He went through that. He went into that. And he came out from the other side of that, blew a hole through it, and said, now because I live, you can live also. You don't have to be afraid of it. I've gone through it already for you. He turned it around. One of the classic books in Christianity is a book called Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress. Some of you have read this. Some of you are familiar with the story. But toward, toward the end of the story, the author writes, um, John Bunyan writes, that there are two people, Christian and hopeful, that arrive right at the river that's at the brink of the celestial city. And they have to cross the river to get to the city. They're almost there, but this river is stopping them. And the river looks deep, and it looks fast, and there's no bridge to cross it. They've got to go right through it. They're afraid. They're scared. They know they have to pass the river to get into the city, which is their destination. The river, by the way, signifies death. So Hopeful goes first. And he goes through the river. He turns back, and he looks at Christian, and he says, Brother, be of good cheer. I can feel the bottom, and it's good. Remember when the king said that you will pass through the waters and I will be with you? He's right here walking with me through this river, through to the celestial city. You don't have to be afraid, Christian. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I have nothing to fear. Why? Because you are with me. Jesus removes the sting of death from us. Number three, we'll close with this. These guys were tempted to give up. These guys were tempted to give up. Look at verses 16 to verse 18. This is the final fear that these guys faced, and possibly the greatest fear, but I think he saved the best for last. The temptation was to quit. In life, there are many temptations that we face. But when we read the book of Hebrews, and he talks about the temptations that we face, the writer is not talking about the different things that we struggle with, but the biggest theme that he's talking about is the idea that people are ready to give up on their faith. They were tempted to throw in the towel. They were tempted to go easy in their walk with Jesus. They were tempted to not let Jesus be the center of their lives. They were tempted to not publicly identify with Jesus and the church because of all of the dangers that they faced for being a follower of Jesus. So the writer is telling them that Jesus didn't quit on you. He endured more than you and I will ever will, so he is able to help you when you are tempted to quit. Look at verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those being tempted. What a great verse. The writer wants you to know that Jesus really did enter into your lives. That they, even though they haven't seen him with their own eyes, He entered into their world and was tempted in every way. He really did walk in their shoes. He really did face temptation like they did and like we do. Many of us don't understand that. Most of us don't understand the humanity of Jesus. We kind of have this idea of the humanity of Jesus. He's human, but he's a little higher than us because God's in him too, right? He really, but he he didn't really become human like us. We don't understand this really well. Even when we think about the birth of Jesus, we think that Jesus knew what was going on the whole time. He was pretending to be human, even though he really wasn't. But Jesus really was human. There was an old heresy that was going on during this time that said that Jesus only appeared to be human. He was totally human. How was he human? He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. He was totally human. He learned He grew, he loved, he ate, he slept. He was astonished, he was glad, he was angry, he was sarcastic. He cried, he was troubled, he bled. He prayed, he fasted, he read, he learned the scriptures. He smiled, he frowned, he laughed, he cried. He entered into every element of human experience that me and you can imagine. Why did he go to this depth? Why did he go all the way down and become like us? So that the Bible says he can be a faithful and a merciful high priest. Merciful is the idea that he could gather up all of the emotions that we feel and our feelings and bring them to himself and know what we're going through because he has been there. He's been there. 
It's one thing for God to sit in heaven after he has created you and say, I know that you feel bad, but I really don't know what that feels like myself because it's kind of nice here in heaven. It's a totally different thing when God says, I'm going to show up and become like you and identify with you. He comes down, becomes one like us, suffers with us, knows exactly what it feels like. Many people say that Jesus suffered, but did he really suffer? Does he really know what it's going on in my life? Does he really know what it's like to be in my shoes? Does he really know the pain, the anguish that I face in my life? Does he know how much life hurts right now? He cheated kind of, didn't he? He was God in human flesh. So therefore, it's not the same as me. It's not like what I'm going through because he kind of cheated. That allowed him to overcome temptations in ways that I couldn't overcome. Did Jesus cheat this way? I would say this. Here's what I think. Jesus had the greater suffering because Jesus never gave into sin. He never did. He never gave into it. We give in so easily, don't we? But Jesus never gave in. Only those who try to resist temptation really know how strong temptation really is. Picture this. I somehow convinced you guys um, to, for you to stand with me in front of a wind tunnel, right? And we're all standing there in front of this wind tunnel. And I... I don't know why you followed me, but you did. And I, you're standing there, I'm standing there, and I turn on the switch. And the wind is blowing in full force. The first one that falls down really doesn't know the full power of the wind. You gave in too quickly. But the last one standing in the wind tunnel is the one that experienced the most force coming at them and resisted it longer than anyone else. The last one standing. Can I tell you something? All of us in this room have toppled over. We weren't able to stand. But Jesus took on humanity, and he stood, and he stood, and he still stands. It wasn't able to knock him over. We weren't able to stand. None of us were. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus stood and faced the whole thing, and he never fell down. And he faced the full brunt of temptation, and he never falls down. C.S. Lewis says that a man that gives into temptation after being tempted for five minutes never doesn't know what it would be like an hour later if he had not given in. That's why bad people, in a sense, never know little about badness. They live in a sheltered life by always giving in. We find out the strength of evil by trying to resist it. We find out how strong evil is when we resist it and try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only human who never yielded to temptation. He's the only man who fully knows what temptation is really like. He faced more than you and I would ever face. That's why Isaiah, Isaiah calls him a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was always like this. He was always a man of sorrows. The idea of the language is that he was always sorrowful. He was always resisting temptation. He would never give in, but he was always coming at him full force. Me and you, we know what it's like to give in to temptation. There's this temporary moment of satisfaction of enjoying evil, but then it destroys us, doesn't it? We feel that. We know that. But Jesus never gives in. He always resists. That's why he's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was tempted to forsake his calling. He was tempted to take the easy way out. That's how Satan tempted him in the wilderness. He was tempted to quit. He was tempted to not go all the way to the cross. He was tempted to give in and throw, throw in the towel. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus thought about the cross and it, it brought him great anguish. He staggers and he cries out to God, God, if it's your will, would you remove this cup from me? He staggered at the thought of what he was about to endure. He was tempted just like this poor church was. And like you and I, are when we try to throw in the towel, but he didn't. He didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. He knows the full brunt of temptation, even greater than any of us would ever know. That's why the late writer would later encourage us that look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is seated at the right hand of God, at the throne of God, considered him, consider him, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. 
Do you feel embarrassed that your faith in Jesus isn't popular in our culture today? That because you believe the God of the Bible, culture will reject you? Remember that Jesus threw you on his back, hacked his way through sin, death, hell, and Satan, and brought you into the presence of the Father. He never abandoned you. Do you feel ashamed from the ridicule that you face in your life, from the shame of your past, from the moments that you have let define your life? Remember, Jesus places his arms around you and he calls you his brothers, his sisters, and places you on his resume. Do you feel afraid of death this morning? Remember, Jesus disarms Satan. He blows a hole through the power of death. He changes it from being our enemy to now being our friend and so that it can welcome us into the presence of God. Do you feel tempted to quit and throw in the towel? Remember, Jesus suffered more than you and I will ever know or ever experience. Not just so that he could save you, but so that he could empathize with you and help you. Consider him who did all of this so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He's with you. Do you see what the writer is saying about suffering here? Do you see what he's saying? He doesn't give us an answer to why suffering happens or why we go through difficulties in life, but he does tell us that the reason we suffer is not because God doesn't care. It's not because God doesn't know what we're going through. It's not because God doesn't understand because he does. He entered into it. He walks in our shoes. He identifies with us. That's exactly what's going on. See, that should bring us encouragement in our walk with Jesus. That should bring you endurance to keep pushing, keep striving, and not giving up. This morning, maybe you're wrestling with living out your faith for Jesus. Maybe you're concerned what people will think if you know that you're a follower of Jesus. Maybe you fear that if you point them to Jesus as the way of salvation, maybe they will reject you or turn their backs on you. May I remind you that he's carried you this far. He will carry you all the way through. Maybe you are afraid to step up because of shame in your life, because of stuff that have happened, because of um, sins that you've committed. May I remind you, you are his brother. You are his sister. You can go forth boldly because you don't have Jesus on your resume. Jesus has you on his resume. Maybe you're afraid this morning of the unknown and what's going on in your life and what you're facing and situations in your life. Jesus says, I've come and blow, blew a hole through the power of death. And if I can blow a hole through the power of death, I can take care of whatever situation you're facing this morning. I'm with you. I'm with you. Maybe this morning you're tempted to quit. Maybe you're tempted to just give up and give in. Maybe you're tempted to just say, this is too difficult, this is too hard. And Jesus comes in and says, I know what it's like. I've been there. I've been tempted. I've, every, the full brunt of the force came against me. I didn't give in, not simply so I could save you, but that when you go through it, I can be with you and remind you to keep pushing. Keep striving. Don't give up. Don't quit. You will make it because you are mine. This morning as we come to the table, the table is the greatest reminder to us that we are his. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He takes us from the enemy lines, rescues us, redeems us from the pits of hell, and he says, now you're mine. Now you're mine. You're my child. You're my brother. You're my sister. This morning, as you examine your hearts, would you examine your attitudes, your affections? If there's anything not like Jesus, would you repent? Would you come to a Savior that's ready to embrace you? And as you do, I invite you to come to the table. The way we do communion here is we don't pass the elements out, but when you are ready, you can come and grab the elements and come back to your seats and we will partake of it together. But I ask you, would you prayerfully check your heart with Jesus this morning? Are you tempted? He says, don't give up. Are you afraid? 
He says, I've beaten the worst that there is. He says, are you full of shame? He says, I identify with you. Are you embarrassed? He says, I have opened the doors of heaven for you. Nothing should stop us from being what God has called us to be. Examine your hearts. Are you living for Jesus the way he's calling you to live? If not, would you repent? Come to the table, celebrate what Jesus has done, and let's worship him for who he is. Let's worship.